Jesus says, I am coming soon.
Welcome to worship on this Sunday of love. We start this morning with the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we end this evening with Christmas Eve. I thank you all for coming out this morning. I know for some this was will probably be two services, and I appreciate you coming out for the morning one as well. This is an important service, and I welcome you to all join us again at four o'clock, because we will have different musicians as well. <laughs> we were lucky in the fact that we have a lot of richness of musicians in this community. And so the Monroe Brass Quintet was able to be with us this morning. And we have some woodwinds who will be with us, some woodwinds and strings and soloists who will be with us this evening. So I hope you'll be able to join us both this morning and this evening. And um, we welcome you and are glad you're here. Let us rise in body and spirit to call ourselves to the worship of God. Forever is a long time. We will we sing of God's steadfast love forever. Forever is a long time. God's faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Forever is a very long time. We will trust God forever. Let us worship God. Please join me in singing and gathering him number 107. Awake, awake. Our sin. 
Merciful God, as we watch and wait for signs of your expansive love, forgive our narrow thinking. As we repent in the wilderness with John, we confess that we often lack the imagination to testify to the coming light. As we visit the home of Elizabeth, we relent our loss of wonder and our failure to recognize miracles among us. Even as we hear the witness of the angels and the shepherds, we confess that we do not make haste to go and see the Christ. Forgive our apathy and small-mindedness. When the way is over and all is finished, open our minds to recognize the strength and wisdom of Christ. God with us. Amen. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Well, I know that we're light on children in worship this morning. I also know that I have children who are watching online. So I will share our story today, Who is Coming to Our House, by Joseph Slate, illustrated by Ashley Wolf. I have Teddy and Maureen. That's enough, right? <laughs> Who is coming to our house? the rig. We must clean, said Lem. Dust the beams, says Ram. Who is coming to our house? Someone, someone, says Mouse. Sweep the earth, says Chick. Stack the hay, says Goose, and quick. Spin new webs, says Spider. I will line the crib with iron. Who is coming to our house? Someone, someone, says Mouse. Someone's coming from afar. I will nose the door ajar. But it is dark, says Cat. They will never come, says Rat. Yes, they'll come, says Mouse. Someone's coming to this house. I will lay an egg, says Hen. I will spread my tail for them. Who is coming to our house? Mary and Joseph 
whispers mouse. Welcome, welcome to, to our house. So we're getting ready on Christmas Eve to welcome Jesus once again to our house. So this is a pretty simple story, but it's one reminding that the whole world prepared for Jesus to come. Animals, all of creation. And so I invite you to listen to the story today. We're actually getting to hear the early part of the story. And tonight we'll get to complete, we'll, we'll move on. We don't usually get to hear two verses of scripture back to back. So we, because you know, if we looked at it all at once, would y'all be able to listen to it? You'd kind of get bored, right? Yeah. I, I, I know that. So we're going to do first chapter this week. Tonight, or this morning, and we'll do second chapter tonight. So keep listening, okay? Thank you. Brian, will you sit that back on the back table for me? Let us pray. Eternal God, by your Holy Spirit, and through these prophetic writings, Reveal to us the mystery of the ages. Teach us to be faithful to your will, and strengthen us according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The first reading comes to us from 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Noah, I mean to Nathan, excuse me. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the peoples of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. <clears throat> and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I have appointed judges over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Thus ends the reading of this text. Thank you. 
Our second reading comes from the first chapter of Luke. It's actually 26 through 55. I didn't skip the middle part. So listen for God's word to us. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believes there will, would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliest of his servants. Surely from now all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Now, there are places that we expect we might meet angels. On mountaintops, in sanctuaries, even in the wilderness. And there are people we expect to receive angelic messengers. Patriarchs like Abraham offering hospitality to strangers who were angels in disguise. Or Jacob wrestling with an angel in the night and then demanding a blessing. Or prophets like Elijah, dejected in the wilderness. We imagine that angels must be alarming as they usually begin their messages with, do not be afraid. In today's reading from the Gospel according to Luke, Gabriel, the angel or messenger of the Lord, appears in a small town. 
in a rural province, in a quotidian setting, to a young girl at home. It's this Annunciation that begins today's reading. If you enter any art museum, the Renaissance art room is team with paintings of Madonna and child. They signify Mary's holiness with a crown of stars or a halo, a rays of light shining down on her. She seems ethereal, placid, set apart, a holy vessel rather than a flesh and blood woman. In Roman Catholic circles, there's a devotion to Mary as a powerful saint interceding for the faithful. She still seems set apart, not terribly relatable, but revered. Luke's gospel, however, gives us a different image. First, Gabriel starts with a greeting that leaves Mary more bemused than frightened. Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. When Mary looks perplexed, the angel assumes she must be frightened. Angels are used to inspiring fear. But Mary does not seem to be afraid. She's confused. Favored one? How am I favored? Mary was a young girl, living in her family's home, in an arranged marriage to someone that her family chose for her, without any sort of social power, without any sort of economic power, without any sort of positional power. And this angel, who appears in her home, not in the temple, not on a mountaintop, greets her as favored? Gabriel goes on to deliver his message. Remember that the gospel writer in Luke endeavors to give us a narratively and theologically cohesive message. So Gabriel connects Jesus to the house of David. What is most amazing is that while Mary asks the question of biology, she doesn't stay there. Because Mary knows God. God does the impossible all the time. In fact, Mary stands in a long line of women who've embraced faithfulness and love in equal measure. Sarah, Hannah, Rachel, even Mary's relative Elizabeth have been given children in their barrenness. So despite her confusion, at the angel's message and her question of, how can this be? Mary knows that this is not a question of how this is possible, but of who God is. And Mary says yes. In our history, we've set, cast Mary as a handmaid, a divine vessel, a porcelain figure, who has acted upon rather than acted. However, Luke's gospel moves us from amusement to wonder to affirmation. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She doesn't argue with Gabriel, I'm not worthy, not me. She's not passively accepting or mute. Mary knows who God is. Mary knows that she is precious. She knows that she is loved. She says, yes, I will be a mother. Yes, I will raise this child, knowing full well that he belongs not just to me, but also to God. Mary's yes is not to privilege, but to service. It will not take long for her to hear the affirmation that her soul will be pierced, and still 
she willingly accepts. Now, if I had gone with just the revised common lectionary this year, we would have ended our reading with Gabriel's departure, or ended the reading there and picked back up at Mary's song at verse 46. But I made a conscious choice not to skip over Mary's visit to Elizabeth. Two pregnant women, both expecting biologically impossible children, gathered together for support. And even in utero, John recognizes Jesus and jumps for joy in Elizabeth's womb. These two women are the first to acknowledge what the coming of Emmanuel brings, what the kingdom of God means, and it's not what society expects. You see, at that time, many believed that the anticipated Messiah would be a conquering hero, overthrowing Roman occupation. The Messiah would be a king in the sense that David was a great king. He would be from the line of David and would be a political hero. But Mary and Elizabeth know differently. God's kingdom does not start from the halls of power or the fortress tower. God's kingdom turns the world on its end, lifting up the lowly. The women, who would have been considered less than in their society, he has called to them favor and will turn the world upside down. Mary sings with a chorus of women who sing throughout scripture, knowing that God brings down the powerful, lifts up the lowly, fills the hungry, and sends the satiated away empty. God is not making incremental change, but is instigating a paradigm shift. Mary and Elizabeth know this because they've been recognized by God and offered a faithful yes to God's call. Now, Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, wanted an intellectual understanding of the mechanics of God's grace. But Elizabeth knows that she has met God and her young, pregnant relative because Elizabeth's pregnant belly reacts accordingly. This is beyond the realm of anyone who held power in their society. They never knew what this was like. But Mary knows, not just because Gabriel offered God's message, not just because her older relative Elizabeth confirmed it, but because Mary knows that God, who pays attention to a young girl in a forgotten town, will turn the world around. The two women stayed together for several months. They probably compared stages of pregnancy. The first time they felt the flutter of their child's movement, the increasing pressure on their bladders, the strengthening kicks, and maybe even the strange feeling of hiccups in utero. Strengthened by this connection to someone who understands, Mary continues to sing, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Mary's song echoes in the parables of the kingdom that Jesus continues to share, echoes in the way of righteousness that Jesus ushers in, echoes in the reign of God, as it breaks into our world today. And it all started with a young woman saying yes. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. My soul cries out with a joyful shout, which is an Irish um, folk tune <laughs> that has set the Magnificent it, to a, a new tune. So please sing with me uh, hymn number 100.
as we prepare to come before God for prayer, are there particular concerns you'd like to pray for this morning? You might have noticed my husband is not with us. Um, he got called into the hospital. So we pray for the family who's just experienced a great loss. And we pray for the staff and those my husband is ministering to right now at the hospital. Chris. My sister Sherry broke her leg. Broke her, broke her hip last week. So oh. We pray for Chris's sister Sherry and her broken hip. Oh. Let us pray. God of all history, God of all mystery, we come before you in prayer, seeking your purpose for the world. We pray for those without ha housing. Help them find refuge and safety. We pray for the leaders of nations. Give them wisdom to seek your will. We pray for the meek and lowly. Claim them as beloved and blessed. We pray for the high and mighty. Humble them to serve others. We pray for children and youth. Empower them to answer your call. We pray for older people. Satisfy them with dreams fulfilled. We pray for those who wait. Let them not lose hope. We pray for those who work particularly for those who work during this holiday season. <clears throat> Equip them for building up your realm. We pray for those who are in our hearts, for the family at the hospital and the staff experiencing a loss, for Chris's sister, Sharon, as she recovers from her broken head. Help us to be faithful in serving you, O oh God. Strengthen us according to the gospel and proclaim the good news of Jesus, to whom we give glory forever. Amen. And who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, <coughs> generosity with that you all share with the community on a regular basis for the ways you share your time your talent your treasure for building up the kingdom of God we give thanks <laughs> What are we thankful for? My girls are in town. Yay, your girls are in town. <laughs> I'm thankful I made it just so we make a time to listen to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have to 
to listen to your wife's sermon. <laughs> rise and sing with me our closing hymn, Now the Heavens Start to Whisper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.